to keep give it from happening. Okay. All right. So this is the next lecture of Math 140 Business. We're going to go over the exam. Uh, number one, here is the small part of the data set that describes the fuel economy of model year 2014 model vehicles. What are the individuals in this set? So I looked through some of the exams. It looked like most people got this right, if not everyone. The individuals are just the vehicles themselves because everything else are the variables that correspond to those individuals. In fact, what are the variables? Well, let's see what was given. Going left to right, we have vehicle class. We have transmission type, number of cylinders, city miles per gallon, highway mile per, miles per gallon, and annual fuel cost. So it's just reading them off left to right. Then the question is, which of them are quantitative? It's all the ones with numbers, number of cylinders, city miles per gallon, highway mile per gallon, annual fuel costs, those four. Uh, are there any questions on the first one? No. Okay, in terms of how much time that should have taken you on the test, what's, the, what's a fair amount of time? A minute? Yeah. Okay, a minute for that one. All right, number two, do you listen to the country radio? The rating service Arbitron places US radio stations into more than 50 categories that describe the kinds of programs they broadcast, which formats attract the largest audiences. Here are Arbitron's measurements of the share of the listening audience at a given time for the most popular formats. We have country, we have news, talk, etc. What percent of the radio audience listens to stations with other formats? How do I do this one? Other formats. So I think you add all that up uh, and then you do 100 minus the total. Exactly it. So I did it over here and it took me, what did I get? I got 23.6%. Does that number ring a bell? Yes. Okay, 23.6%. And if you look at the three bar graphs, the only one with a high other at around 23.6% is bar graph B. Um, so, I mean, that's just, none of the other ones have an others. I mean, the others here doesn't make any sense. And then for part C, would it be uh, correct to display these data in a pie chart? Why or why not? The answer is yes and no. I would accept either one as long as the reason makes sense. Yes, because it's categorical data. But if you said no, because there's too many categories to really fit into a pie chart and to be able to read it off, I would have accepted that as well. Um, did anyone do either of those two? Or maybe both? I did the first option. Yeah, it's categorical, so the yes, but there's a lot of them and you really can't fit it in well, so that would make no. Either one is okay. How much time would this, take, uh, this problem should have taken? approximately it's probably a minute and something a couple of yeah. seconds just put the just, add the just counting it yeah yeah you got to do calculations here let's say let's say three minutes give or yeah, take kind of. okay to display the distribution of grades a b c d e f for all students in the course it will be correct to use which of the following this is categorical so it's pie chart or bar graph um, a description of different housing in the market includes the variable square footage of the house and average monthly bill. They are both quantitative. A political party's bank includes the zip codes. Zip codes is categorical. I mean, that's an example that I did in class. Uh, do adolescent girls eat fruits? We all know fruit's good for us. Many of us don't eat enough. The fruit below, the figure below is a histogram of the number of servings of fruit per day for 74, 17 year old girls. What percent of these girls ate five or more servings per day? Five or more, that's this one, this one, this one, or this one. Here we have five, three, three, and three. That's a total of 14. 14 out of the 74 is 18.9%. Name that variable. A survey of a large class asked the following questions. Are you female or male? Male is zero, female is one. Are you right or left-handed? Right is zero, left is one. What's your height in inches? 
And how many minutes do you spend on a typical weeknight? Well, the easiest one is right-handed or left-handed because there's only two options. So that limits it to one of these two. But we know that right-handed people, there's much more right-handed people than left-handed people. So this one has to be two. Because of that, the female male one has to be this one because it also only has two options. Um, how many minutes do you spend on a typical weeknight? Most people probably don't study at all. And then fewer study of minim medium amount and fewer even more, which will make sense that this one be four. And we know height is normal. So it should look kind of like a normal curve. Um, so that was page two. Are there any questions on, on, these, on any of these uh, five questions, three, four, five, six, or seven? To be honest, on, on the before the last one, um, I didn't know the last three were were at three. I thought they were at two point five. Well, one second, one second. So we're talking about girls. How many girls there are? How do yeah. you have two point five girls? I don't know. I don't. I was just, I was just <laughs> so confused on that question because okay. I did it at the end. So okay, but you understand how seeing the answer? Yeah, now I get it. No, fairly I'm straightforward, just... correct? Yeah, true, true. So, the, so are there any, I mean, this one was, uh, hold on a second. Hold on one second. Uh, okay. So uh, this page, I mean, were these questions relatively self-explanatory? Now that you've seen the answer, I'm not saying you all knew how to do them right away, but seeing the answer, was anything here significantly difficult? I think it was pretty straightforward a little okay. bit, yeah. Okay. Question eight. Uh, if a distribution is skewed to the left, that means the mean is pulled more to the left than the median. So the mean is probably less than the median. What percent of observations are greater than the third quartile? Well, every quartile divided into 25%. So when you hit the third quartile, there's 25% left. To make a box plot, what must you know? Well, you could know the individual observations, but the five number summary is all you need to be able to do a box plot. You must know the five number summary. Those are the five numbers that appear. According to the US Census Bureau's current population survey, the mean and median of people 25 years old with a bachelor's degree with no higher degree were those two numbers. Which of these numbers are the mean and which is the median? So this one, I, I, this one is the first one that really I feel requires um, actual thinking beyond just what we did in class because you have to use common sense here. Um, is this symmetric? Is it skewed left or is it skewed right? So if I were to make a graph of how much people earn, most people earn either nothing or small amounts or normal amounts. And then you have a few people who get really good jobs and earn a lot, which means the distribution should be skewed to the right. Because of that, the mean is pulled more to the right, which means the mean is gonna be higher than the median. Did anyone use that reasoning to get that one correct? Does that make sense? I did use it. Yeah, okay. Um, again, that one, I'm not saying none of the other ones are hard. I, I don't wanna make that judgment, but this was the first one that was, you had to go a little bit beyond what we did. Uh, number 12, the National Association of College and University Business Officers collect collects data on college endowments. In 2012, its report included the endowment values of 843 colleges and universities in the US and Canada. When the endowment values are arranged in order, what is the location of the median? We did this. You take the number of data points, you add one, you divide by two. This was the 422nd data point. Okay, so on this page, how were these questions in hindsight? This is your time to, uh, to, to, to talk to me, to, to let me know whether my expectations are justified or not, or so whether or not you feel it should be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm off. So talk to me, please. How were these questions? Good so far, okay. 13, travel time to work are on the average longer in New York than in Canada and North Carolina. Here are the travel times of 20 randomly chosen New York workers. Use your calculator to find the median and mean. So you put it to the calculator and you have it do all the work for you. When I did it just a few minutes ago, hopefully I didn't screw up, but what I got was the mean 
was 31.95 and the median was 25. Do those numbers ring a bell? Yes, no, yeah. yes. In this case, the mean is greater than the median. Um, I didn't actually tell you to take it to the next level. I just said to compare them. Um, but this would mean that the distribution is probably skewed which way? Right. Skewed to the right. Uh, find the five number summary of the data. Again, these are all on your calculator. The min is four. Q1 is 17.5, Q2 is 25, Q3 is 42.5, and the max is 80. From that, you can create you know, your box plot, which looks something like this with a longer tail here to 80 and four. I mean, you should have a, a um, an axis, so that's a little more accurate than this, but there is. And then I'm, I, I, I made a mistake, so, not a mistake, but I, I when I made this test, I I thought I had picked a number that's high, high enough to, to clearly be an outlier or not be an outlier. But I, I actually was was horrible because when I did the 1.5 IQR rule and got 37.5, then nothing, no data points were less than that number because this one is way past four. But when I did Q3 plus 37.5, I actually landed exactly on 80. And the rule was, you know, past 80, it's considered to be an outlier. Before 80, it's not an outlier. But what about exactly on 80? So um, if you mention either way, if you got the math correct, and then you said it is or is not an outlier, I will give you credit on that one as long as the logic is correct. Okay, so does that make sense for that question? In hindsight, I should have picked 90. I thought 80 was high enough, and it was ironically the worst number I could have picked. How are these questions? Or this one question? It was decent. Decent, okay. So, so far, so far, were there any questions that were really, um, you know, extremely challenging? Not yet, okay. Number 14, which distribution is a lower deviation? We talked about this. Uh, this one is lower because all the data, or most of the data points are closer to the mean than further away. We know the deviation measures spread. And um, when, the, when the data points are far from the mean, it's got a high deviation. And when it's close to the mean, it's got a lower deviation. So here, the majority are close to the mean. So the, uh, on number 14, the answer is A. For 15, this is a, a calculator problem uh, or the 68.95.99.7 rule. If you go to your calculator and you do lower, um, Actually, we want 95%. So basically what we want here is, depending on the calculator, you could ask it to do 95% in the center, or you could ask it to do 2.5% on either side, because 95% in the center and 2.5% on either side are the same. And when you, have, you, when you do it with a mean of 852 and a deviation of 882, my calculator gave me 691 to 1,013. Um, the driest 2.5% of the years is less than 691 because it's essentially the same answer as the previous one. The bottom 2.5% is less than 691. And what percent are higher than 934? Again, you do the calculator, you go 934 to infinity and it gives you about 15.9%. Again, all of those were very, very quick with the calculator based upon the mean, the deviation, and your normal or inverse normal buttons. Questions on that one? Again, so far so good? Yeah. 16. In 2013, when she was a high school senior, Donna scored a 670, where the mean, was 514 and the deviation was 118. Jonathan, on the other hand, took the ACT. He scored a 26, where the mean was 20.9 and the deviation was 5.3. Find the z-scores. Well, we have a formula for z-score. Data minus mu over sigma. Donna's was 1.32. 
and um, Jonathan was 0.962. So assuming that both tests measure the same kind of ability, who had the higher score, Donna or Jonathan? Donna. Donna, she had a better z-score. Three, um, here we have a normal curve with a mean of 25.3 and a deviation of 6.5. And the question says, what's the first and third quartiles? Now, this one also might have been one of the more challenging ones because we don't normally deal with quartiles with a normal curve. We deal with it when you have box plots and you know stem and leaf plots and whatnot. But if you understand what the quartiles are, it's just the first 25%, the next 25%, the next 25%, the next 25%. So all you do is you go to your calculator and you say, what's the value that cuts off the lower 25% when the mean is 25.3 and deviation is 6.5 and out pops 20.9. And if you do the upper 25% with the same information, out pops 29.7 giving you an IQR of 8.8. So uh, Professor wrote 92.7. Oh, I did write 92.7. I'm sorry, I didn't mean 29.7. Um, so does that make sense for that one? I think I actually spoke about in class, I, I, I seem to recall um, talking about the fact that you can do um, uh, first you know, quartiles with any distribution. Uh, just 25%, next 25%, next 25%, next 25%. 18, which of these is most likely to be normal? Uh, income per person, sale prices of homes, or lengths of 100 newborns. Um, so what do you guys think? Which of these is most likely to be normal? Wouldn't it be lengths of newborns? Definitely. The other ones would definitely be skewed. Uh, to complete the shape of a normal distribution, I only need the mean and deviation. Those are the only two things you need to do the normal distribution. So how are these questions? Uh, what was the interquartile again? I cannot see the answer. Oh, 8.8. .8. This is Q3 minus Q1. Sorry, can you go over that one again? Which one, the last one? Just the, the top one. The very first one? Uh, the, the one that's like first quartile and then- Oh, oh this one right yeah. there? Yes, yes, that one. Well, the first quartile is the point that cuts off 25% to the left, right? Yes. I mean, that's, what a, that's what a quartile is. You know, it, the first 25%, next 25%, next 25%, last 25%. So all I have to do is go to my calculator, plug in the mean and deviation, and ask it to give it the value for which 25% is to the left, the inverse norm. So inverse norm. 25% to the left when the mean is 25.3 and the deviation is 6.5 and I'll pops 20.9. Oh, got it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, give me one second, guys. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh-oh, uh-oh, it's the wrong button. Okay, we're back. Okay, so now question number 20. So the scores of adults are normal with a mean of 100 and a deviation of 15. Clara scores a 132. What's her z-score? Well, we have a formula for z-score. It's gonna be her data, which is 132 minus the mean, which is 100 over 15. That's what, that's 32 over 15. So I did the math earlier and what did I get? I got 2.13. That's the z-score. What does that mean, 2.13? She scored 2.13 standard deviations above the mean. That's exactly what z-scores measure. 2.13 standard deviations above the mean. She scores higher than what percent of all adults? Well, in that case, I will look at my normal curve and I'll go to 132 and I'll ask it to calculate the probability of being beneath it and it gives me 98.4% with a quick normal distribution uh, calculation. Now, the proportion of observations from a standard normal, well, what's the standard normal again? What's the mean of a standard normal?
What's the mean of the standard normal distribution? We've done this. What's the mean of standard normal? Please someone validate my existence as a teacher. What's the mean of the standard normal distribution? I didn't Zero. know this one. Zero with a deviation of one. We did that, right? The standard, the standard normal, the one that we compare all normals to is a zero one. So go to your calculator and say, here's 1.45. What's the probability of being more than 1.45? And I'll pops 7.35%. Anahi, what was the question? Oh, I was just saying I didn't really understand that one because I didn't really get the wording of it, but it's okay. Um, yeah, me too. Do you recall us in class talking about the standard normal distribution? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, I, I remember. It's just, it was really confusing at the moment. I understand. Yeah, listen. True. No, no, get it. Seeing someone who knows what they're doing give you the answers, things make a lot more sense than when you're in the moment trying to do it yourself. Trust me, I, I, I get that. I just want to see if in hindsight, seeing the answers, you recognize that the questions so far were fair questions that there hasn't been really a question that was or maybe you think there was this is a judgment call that was um you know not within the realm of what you could have been handling if that makes sense what i'm saying yeah it's just like the 1.45 like i yeah. didn't really get what i was supposed to do with it but do you see it now based upon my answer or still not no so a, a, a distribution in general is a collection of values that your random variable can take right you don't know in advance what you're going to get so the distribution says it can get this with this likelihood and this with this likelihood and this with this likelihood and so on so the question is what's the likelihood that i would get a number greater than 1.45 so if i look at my curve which is this one right here I'm asking for the likelihood of falling in this little area past 1.45. So if you recognize that it's a standard normal distribution, so that the mean is zero and sigma is one, you go to your calculator and you do mean, I don't know the order, but mean one, sorry, mean zero, deviation one to the right of 1.45, and out pops how likely it is to be to the right of 1.45. Uh, where do you go to like input those? A uh, normal CDF. Okay. Remember, we only, did, we only did two things, normal CDF and inverse norm, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. Automated manufacturing operations are quite precise, but still vary. Uh, the width in inches is given by a normal distribution. And we want to be between this number and that number. So what proportion of slots meet these specifications? Well, normal, uh, we have the mean, we have the uh, uh, mu, sigma, we have left, and we have right. They gave me all four things that I need, and I'll pops 96.3%. Correct? Make sense? Yes. Okay. That's normal CDF on the calculator, right? All, the only two things you can do are normal CDF and inverse norm. Okay, true or false? The possible values of the standard deviation are S greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> S is a square root, can't be negative. Yes, true, I guess would be better. The only way the deviation could be equal to zero is if all the values <clears throat> in the data set are the same. S is the spread. The only way the spread could be zero is if there is no spread. They're all the same value, true. Deviation has no units, false. If it had no units, how can you add it Plus or minus makes no sense. The correlation coefficient has no units. True, they cancel. R is between negative one and one. We certainly spoke about that in class. The correlation coefficient is the same if you interchange the explanatory and response. True, we spoke about that in class. The equation of the regression line remains the same if we interchange them. False. The correlation might be equal, but the y and x are not perfectly symmetric. If it's a low slope here and you switch them, it's going to be a high slope. So not the same. 
Correlation coefficient only applies to linear. I spoke about that in class. Some of the residuals is always zero. I spoke about that in class. And here on a heat, the standard normal distribution is normal of one zero. True. About 50% of the data is in the box. True, because each part is 25%. And the first digit Professor, in a number- Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, it's okay. uh, uh, on the on the other problem, you said it's the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Oh wow! Look at that. Okay, you're right. Wow, that was unintentional. But you were entirely. I was thinking the same thing. thing. <laughs> yes, that was unintentional. I I didn't mean to write that. I meant to write n of zero one. But you are entirely correct. That is a false statement. You are right. The standard normal is n of zero one mean deviation. So you are, you are right, I, I, I misread it. Um, so thank you for that. <clears throat> so uh, next, the first digit in a number is the leaf. Well, no, the stem has lots of leaves on it. So not the other way around. So the stem is to the left and just like a branch, one stem can have lots of leaves, there you go. So those 12 true or false questions, uh, do they, do you guys agree? I mean, I mean, those are all things either we covered or, well, certainly we covered, but um, I mean, do they all make sense? Yes. Uh, now they do, but then, <laughs> I think, you know. Trust me, trust me I get it's it. Just, uh... <laughs> trust me, trust me. In, in, in the moments, you're panicking. Yeah. You're, I get it. Trust me, I get it. 24. Um, you have data on a large group of college students. Here's four pairs of variables measured on these students for each pair. Is it more reasonable to simple to simply ignore the relationship between the two variables? Oh, sorry, to explore the relationship between the two variables, or to view one as explanatory and the other as response? And if that's the case, which is explanatory and which is a response? The number of lectures attended in your statistics course and the grade on the final exam. Do these just have a connection, or <laughs> or do we think that one? Um, um, helps explain the other. And I got Panera bread tonight. I can never get around to eating it. <laughs> get that out of the way. They have a connection. Well, they have a connection, but I think, would you, would you uh, go so far as to say that the more lectures you attend will probably explain how you do well in the final or not do well in the final? Yes. So a uh, number of lectures attended is the explanatory variable and the grade on the final exam is the response variable, not the other way around. I think seems seems uh, relatively um, straightforward. Then we had a regression one. Um, which is the uh, response variable and which is the explanatory variable? So the weight is explanatory, it's on the x-axis and miles per gallon is response, it's on the y-axis. Describe the scatter plot, linear or nonlinear? Linear. Linear, positive or negative? Negative. Sorry, say it again? Negative. Negative. Uh, strong, moderate, or weak? Was it moderate? I would say it's moderate. And are there any out possible outliers? No. I don't see any. So that's it. What's the approximate mileage of the lightest car? Well, here's the weight axis. So the lightest car will be all the way on the left. Oh, there it is up here. So the approximate mileage is what, 41 or so miles per gallon. Which of these is the correlation coefficient? Well, it can't be past one or negative one. Certainly not positive because it's going down. And it's either negative 0.11 or negative 0.82. Negative 0.82. Negative 0.82, negative 0.11 is so close to zero, you wouldn't even see any linearity and we certainly see it here. Uh, check the graph, what is the y-intercept? Well, the equation says the y-intercept is 41.496. What does that mean? It means when X is zero, when the weight of the car is zero, the miles per gallon will be 41.496. Does that make sense? No. Why not? Why does that not make sense? 
There's no car that weighs okay. zero pounds. No car that weighs zero, okay? You can't take the data outside of the data set. What do we call that? Extrapolation. Extrapolation, don't do it. F, what's the slope? Okay, well, back here, the slope was negative 0 0.0032. Slope, negative 0 0.0032. What does this mean in the context of the problem? What does it mean to have a slope of negative 0 0.0032? For every pound that you, um, you add, you lose that much mile per gallon. Excellent. Beautiful. For every pound, you move to the right, the miles per gallon drops by 0 0.0032. Awesome. And use the equation to predict the mileage of a car with 5,000 pounds. Well, that's going to be negative 0.0032x, which is 5,000, plus 41.496. And my math gave me uh, 25.496 miles per gallon. Uh, the mileage of a car with a weight of 6,000 pounds is 20 miles per gallon. What's the residual? Well, the actual is 20. What does the line tell me I should get? The line says, if you plug in 6,000, it should be 22.296. <clears throat> so my residual, which is actual minus predicted, is negative 2.296. What does extrapolation mean? I really spent some time on this. Going out to the data set to make a prediction. Give an example. Well, we had one before, the y-intercept. Did that problem make sense? Lots of parts. But yeah, it makes that's, sense. Yeah, that's for sure. Lots of parts. Okay. <laughs> yeah, lots of parts, but were, were any of them... I mean, I tried to make questions that didn't really depend upon each other, so that if you got one wrong, it didn't ruin the rest. I think those questions were, for the most part, fairly independent. If the correlation between two variables is close to zero, what can you conclude about the scatter plot? Is it a strong straight line pattern? No. No. Clearly not. So it's either a cloud of points with no visible pattern or no straight line pattern, but there might be a strong pattern of another form. And we spoke about that. Correlation only talks about linearity and not about any other form. Okay. Next, each of the following statements contains a blunder. Oh, I like this question. What was the mistake in each case? So the first Good one. Professor? Yeah. Can we go back to the last question? Sure. Yeah. It got me a little confused because I put B and uh, what was the explanation for it being seen? Well, if I gave you the following scatter plot, yeah. what would what would R be? Um, there was no correlation, right? So it'd be like close to zero. R would be zero here, but there's certainly a pattern. That's true. Right? So R can only talk about linearity. It can only talk about linear patterns. It can't talk about any other shape. Okay. You might have another one, but if it's not linear, R won't tell you anything. Okay. All right, Thank next. Oh, no problem. What's the blunder for this statement? There's a high correlation between the sex of American workers and their income. What is the blunder? No R value? Nope. No, I haven't calculated the R value. <clears throat> that's not a blunder i just don't have it no there's a blunder there's something really really bad what's the blunder nobody you can only do correlation for quantitative variables this is categorical cannot do Scatter plots or regression or correlation for categorical, they must be quantitative. Otherwise, you can't have numbers. For B, 
And R is 1.092. What's the blunder? R is greater than one. R is greater than one. C, the correlation between height and weight was R equals 0.63 centimeters per kilogram. What's the blunder? Measurements. No units. Good. Okay. Smokers do not live as long on average as non-smokers. Heavy smokers don't live as long as light smokers. So you regress age of death versus number of packs. The slope of your, grade, of your regression line will be greater than zero, less than zero, or cannot be determined without seeing the data. Less than zero? It is less than zero because the more packs that you smoke, the sooner you die, apparently. I don't smoke, but I'll assume that's the case. That's what everyone told me. Um, an owner of a home in the Midwest installed solar candles, whatever. So here is the equation of the best fit line. How much on average does gas use increase for each additional degree day? 16. 16, that's just the slope. Uh, what is the predicted amount of gas if it's 20 degrees outside or, or 20 whatever, that's my X value. You just plug in 20 into the formula and that gives you what? 16 times 20 is... Uh, Should be like the 400, I think it's A or something. Yeah, 400. Yeah, that's what I remember. Yeah, okay, and some qualitative ones here. A political scientist wants to, to know how college students feel about the social security system. She obtains a list of the 3,456 undergraduates at her college and mails a questionnaire to 250 of them. Of those 250, 104 questionnaires are returned. What is the population in this study? The population is a number, like the first number, and then the sample, I think, would be the, the answers obtained. Good. Population is 3,456, because those are all the people that she's getting questions from. It's on the homework. Yes. True that. And yes. Where do you think I get questions from half the time? Well, not half the time, but enough times. And the sample are the the ones that they came back to. Okay. You see a student standing in front of the student center now and then stopping other students to ask them questions. She says she's collecting student opinions for a class assignment. Why is this sampling method almost certainly biased? Because is it because it's a convenient sample? That's yes, it's a convenient sample. Great. <laughs> yes, she is probably just picking people that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going through your mind, but the fact of the matter is, there's no randomness to it. Wait, professor, I yeah. put uh, interview bias. Would that also work? Interview bias, like the interviewer bias, or I had in my notes. Um, you know what? What the hell? I'll give you credit. Thank you. Just remind me in case I don't. Anyways, um, drink a little, but not a lot. Many observational studies show that the people who drink a moderate amount of alcohol have less heart disease than people who drink no alcohol or who drink heavily. What are the explanatory and response variables? Which one explains which? Alcohol explains if, whether you get heart disease or not. Yes, so that's the question. Alcohol should explain heart disease. Now, moderate group of drinkers as a group tend to be more likely to maintain a healthy weight, get enough sleep, exercise regularly than those who drink no alcohol or drink heavily. No on the midterm, what does that mean? Oh, I asked what food did you get? She said, was that on the homework? And then I said, no, it was on the midterm. I see. Did you, under see. Did you understand the joke? I believe so. Uh, well, it's on someone's midterm now. Sorry. Anyways, are these variables Explanatory, response, or lurking variables? Are they explanatory, response, or lurking variable? Lurking? Yes, because they are not the ones that you are measuring or that you are taking data for. But behind the scenes, they probably have some kind of effect. Um, is the association between drinking and heart disease good reason to think that moderate drinking actually causes less heart disease? Yes or no? 
Does it cause less heart disease? No, because correlation doesn't. Yes, I mean, correlation does not imply causation. I love it. Okay. A large representative random sample of 6,906 US adults collected over 20 years showed that parents reported higher levels of life satisfaction than non parents, with the observed difference being statistically significant. This is an example of what? Observational, randomized comparative experiment, or a matched pair experiment? Observation. Observation. You're not doing anything, you're just watching the data. What electrical changes occur in muscles as they get tired? The student subjects hold their arms above their shoulders until they have to drop them. Meanwhile, the electrical activity in their arm muscles is measured. This is A, observational, B, uncontrolled, or a randomized comparative experiment. Which one is it? Would it be C? It is not C because if it was if it was a comparative, what are you comparing it to? Oh, that's true. What different treatments are you providing these guys? You're having everyone do exactly the same thing, so there's no control. There's observation. No, this is, no, but it's not an observation. If it was an observation, then you wouldn't actually um, you wouldn't actually play a role. You'd just be observing and recording the results from somewhere else. You're the one actually doing the experiment. So it is an experiment with no control. It's an uncontrolled experiment. Um, but I get that that might have been a stretch. So we'll make it a star. It's a one point question, so I don't feel too bad. But I can see why that might have been a little confusing in hindsight based upon what I went over with you over the, over the last eight weeks. So that one may a couple. That one's on me. I can see how it could be confusing. Uh, 36. Juan makes a measurement in a lab and records the results in his lab reports. If he makes the measurements repeatedly, the standard deviation will be sigma equals 10. But he repeats the measurement four times. What is his new deviation of the mean if he repeats the experiment four times? I think you do 10 divided by a uh, square root of four or yes. whatever the number it is. Exactly, five. Um, okay, Michelle, I got you, thank you. And Nelson, I got you too. How many times must Juan repeat the measurement to reduce it to two? Well, just set it equal to two and you get 25. <clears throat> um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announces that last month it interviewed all members of the labor force in a sample of 60,000 households. 6.7% of the people interviewed were unemployed. Is this a sampling, is this number a sampling distribution, a statistic, or a parameter? Sampling? Yes. It's, oh, no. This is the number is not a statistic. sampling. I mean, statistics, statistics. That's <laughs> what I meant to say. All right. My bad. I forgive you. Next. Uh oh, what happened? I lost. There we go. Okay. In April 2011, poll of Canadian adults found that 57% were certain that they would vote in the May. 2011 elections. Election records show that 61.1% of registered voters voted in the election. Is this a sampling distribution, a statistic, or a parameter? Parameter. It's a parameter because the records are using the entire country of all the registered voters. There's no sample, it's everyone. Next, <clears throat> annual returns vary. Uh, we got a mean of 11.7, .7, a deviation of 34.1. What does the law of large numbers say? A, B, C, three options, one in three chance, the law of large numbers. It says nothing about normal, so it's not C. B, as you invest more and more, your average return will get closer to 11.7%. That's exactly what the law of large numbers says. As the sample size gets larger, you approach the true value. Next, scores on the critical reading part of the SAT were roughly normal with mean 496 and deviation 115. You choose an SRS of 100 students and you average them. That means we're going to get the original 115 divided by the square root of 100. That's 115 over a 10. Uh, sorry, now, um, that's, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong question. What's the mean? The mean is still 496. The mean hasn't changed. We talked about that, right? The mean stays the same, but the deviation drops by square root of n, 
So that's 11.5. Whoops, that's 11.5. Um, a newborn baby has a extremely low birth weight in the elbow if it weighs less than a thousand grams. A study of such children in later years examined a random sample of 219 of them. Their mean weight at birth was a 10. The sample mean is an unbiased estimator of the mean weight mu. What does it mean to be an unbiased estimator? It's got nothing to do with normal. So again, C is out. B is just a law of large numbers. So by process of elimination, it has to be A, which says that the average of many values will be close to what we expect. That's exactly what an unbiased estimator is. Uh, the number of hours of a battery lasting before failing varies. We have a situation where it's exponential, which just means strongly skewed to the right. We don't need to know what an exponential is. The central limit theorem says, well, this is the applet, the central limit theorem applet. We we went over it multiple times in class that if you do it, if the sample size gets larger and larger and larger, then the distribution will look more and more normal. So this one is C. And finally, the length of human pregnancies is normal with the mean 266 and deviation 16. The probability that the average pregnancy length for six exceeds 270, well, it's an average. The mean stays the same, but the deviation drops by square root of n. And we wanna know whether or not it exceeds 270. So we just do in the calculator mean deviation 270 is my lower and infinity is my upper and look at whatever it gives and i have it here somewhere i uh, i think it's 0.4 not 100 percent sure on that one but i think it's 0.4 i just can't find my sheet but i seem to remember it being 0.4 so that was the test in hindsight, in honesty, honesty, other than the natural panic that you get when you are taking a test, how many of those questions were legitimately challenging questions? Honestly, be, be honest. If, if you think all of them were, say so. I, I won't get upset. I want to know your honest opinion. Um, I feel like the test wasn't too hard, but there were just some questions that the wording was just like, confusing it in the moment okay fair fair anyone else please because i can only adjust for the next test if i know your complaints about this one and like like some of the questions like when, when we were going through them they were a little hard as we we all agree so to me i'm saying i was just trying to focus so much you know and not to get the answer wrong and that's why i think in general like it was easy that if we if we like knowing the answer right now but yeah. while going through it i think it was just a lot of questions for uh for that time period you know because we we wanted to focus so much on each question and not get answers wrong well of course of course but um let me explain why i asked more questions <clears throat> when you give an open book open note test and a couple people just just if you want to by the way direct message me um your opinions and thoughts you can also do so if you don't want to say it uh, out loud um, I'm totally okay with that as well. But um, <clears throat> when I give, um, when you give a multiple, uh, an open book, open note test, the only way to really make it fair as a testing procedure is to ask more questions. Because if you ask fewer questions, you'll eventually, you know, find the answers and, and you have all the time in the world. It's only really a good test if, if it is a lot of questions. That's just I'm giving you my philosophy on this. So you might not agree, and that's fine. Um, I didn't take it, but it seems like certain chapters were more common. I tried to be, I tried to give uh, a nice scattering. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible that that some were represented more, but that that was an accident. That's just that's just picking questions. Um, someone else said after the review, it looked easier. But during the test, I was overwhelmed. I overcomplicated many of the questions and it caused me to lose time on others. Certainly, I, I can't, you know, I mean, yeah, 100%. I get that. Um, Professor. Yeah. I, I just felt that um, it would have been better if um, like the multiple choice and the short answers were split so we knew what was what. Because I was, 
I was because usually what I do is I go through the multiple choice first and then I do the answers after. But it was like okay. I thought I had more time that I had than I had because I didn't know it was all split off. Okay. Okay. So you know what? So I will um next test I write. So I'll I'll make sure to keep them separate. That's 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 fair. Um, I liked it mixed because it was by it was by chapters, but if um for the most part, but if um it was just because I didn't expect it to be that way because usually it's separated. So I thought, yeah. oh, I got to finish with the multiple choice. Okay, then I can just finish off the rest of the other stuff. I, I hear. Um, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll see what I can do on that one. I don't want to make promises and then go back on my promises, but um, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, but now that I expect it, I feel like, oh, it's it's better. It's just I didn't expect that in the thing. So it kind of made me lose some time because I got so I kind of got shocked when I found out there's all, all these other questions. Gotcha. OK, that's fair. Alberto, your hands up. Uh, um, What's up? Oh, oh, that that was me. The, the one that just asked about the oh, separation. Okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like I needed to organize my notes better because I was spending a lot of time. But yeah, that's exactly it. I felt like I needed to organize my notes better because I was spending a lot of time flipping through them. That's exactly it. A lot of people sometimes open book, open note test. Oh, I'll, I'll write all these notes, open book. Oh, I won't even take notes. I have the book. But then when you get to the test, you're spending so much time looking for things that you don't have time to finish. And that's exactly the thought process of more questions is to is do exactly that. Um, but I, I, I feel other than a couple questions, though, um, I honestly, I feel, well, let me see this question. Who here feels that they could have and should have studied more for the test? No one? <laughs> I feel like I could have, but I- Oh, on me? Okay. <laughs> Anahi, what's your question? <laughs> um, I was just gonna say that if you could just keep the questions like in chapter order, just because like, then we would have to do like the multiple choice and get through like all the chapters, but then we would have to like go back to the first chapters again for the free answers and it would just be like. If you already pass like the chapters knowledge like you don't want to like go back to like. Gotcha. I, I make no promises. Um, but I'll, I'll try. I, I don't mean to like juxtapose anything Alberto said, but it's just like I feel like it's just a more convenient method. Gotcha. I. I yeah. I make no I agree. because we're talking about something that's like three or four weeks away yeah. and I don't want to make a promise now and then completely forget it and, and, and have anyone complain that I that I lied but um, but I'll try to I'll try to keep that in mind oh yeah I now that I understand how the test was was done I understand why it was that way I just it kind of shocked me because I'm used to it being separate okay so, yeah so Okay. Now that I now that I know it's that way, I'm pretty sure I'd be able to like understand. Oh, okay, then I need to get through all this. Okay, well maybe I can do a compromise where make the multiple choice in order, and then the non multiple choice in order, and that way everyone's happy. Or I can do it exactly the opposite, make nobody happy. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah, I'm I'm fine with the way you did it. It's just it was just more of a shock like to it. I, now that I understand the way it is, I I feel like I'd be able to go through it much much faster. All right, good. But in general, uh, it'll hopefully be graded by next week sometime. Um, I have a, just a lot of stuff to grade in my various, like every class has a test that needs to be graded. So I, I, I don't know when they'll be graded by, but I will just try to do them as soon as I can. Another comment, I was prepared for 25 questions, but it was open note. So it makes sense why there will be more. Um, Okay, but just so you know, I did um, I did email everyone earlier, either the day before or maybe even that morning. I don't remember exactly when. No, probably the day before. And I, I did think it was the same day. Was it the same it day? That morning? Like yeah. around nine in the morning. And I did say that there were gonna be more questions. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, yes. Uh, um, this is my second time at CSUN. Oh, on the campus, you mean? Yeah, on campus. So, okay, well, now everyone knows where to go and they know to bring their ID and um, and hopefully it only gets better from here on out. So anyways, that's all I wanted to do today. We'll continue next time. So I will see you all. Um,
Tuesday. Okay. And then, so much, Professor. And, then, and then we start the next half of the yeah. course. Yes. Right, thank you, Professor. Have a good weekend, Professor. All right, guys. You too. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. You too, guys. Thank you so okay, much. Bye -bye. Have a great weekend. So, bye bye. You're welcome. Yeah. You too, Lorena. Okay. Oh, well, I have a question where uh, I don't know if you saw the, the message I sent earlier. I joined a bit late, so I was wondering if I could like get Mark Tardy. Who's this? This is um, uh, Nelson. I thought I did I get you, Nelson. I thought I got you. Uh, oh, you did. Uh, yeah, you're good. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Bye, guys.